evening, everybody. It's such an honor to be here. I am completely in love with your country. I'm enchanted by India. I, um, it's been such a blessing to be here. I love the food, the clothes. I, <laughs> I had a, um, a good friend of mine lived in India for a couple of years, and she loaned me some of her outfits before I came. And I don't know what I'm going to do when I have to go back to the United States and go back to my boring, drab clothes. Um, I love the traditions. I saw this beautiful statue of Ganesh last evening when we were out in town. And it's, this is a beautiful place, and, and you are just so lucky to live here. Um, so, just before I jump in, I, I have a deep bow of, of gratitude to Gita Gupta for the amazing work she's done to try to help her child and to look for solutions and not only do that, which I think is just incredible in and of itself, but to share such an important message today with parents and then the other day with clinicians. I think it's a message that everybody needs to hear and needs to hear again and again, and I'm, I'm just thankful that I, that I got to hear that, and so thank you for sharing that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about a topic that is near and dear to my heart and also something that I could spend lots of time talking about. Those of you who know me would know that I can really talk about anything and nothing for a long time, so that shouldn't surprise you. Um, but I have a very brief amount of time, and I'm going to talk about a very complex topic in very simple terms. We've had a number of speakers in the last couple of days, and also again today, who have talked about really complex problems. But one of the things that I hope that you notice is that people start with a simple explanation and a relatively simple solution. So for example, a lot of people talked about how they were using some sort of um, intervention derived from ABA or behavior analysis, and then when something didn't work, they moved on. And I just want to encourage you to look for simple explanations first. As Lauren says, sometimes a zebra is just a zebra, and it's true. And if you start with a simple explanation and it's effective, you're going to have a whole lot easier time because simple explanations have simple solutions. Start with that and then fill in when those things don't work. So what I'm going to do a little bit today is talk about a very simple explanation and a simple solution that will be enough some of the time. I don't want to lead you to think that I think in any way that what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the solution for all problems because I know very well it's not. It's really a starting point. Okay, now that I've wasted almost half my time on a caveat, I will move on. So I thought a good starting point might be just to talk for a few minutes about what exactly behavior is. So when we, when we think about behavior, when I'm trying to help a parent, help a clinician, help an individual solve some sort of problem, somebody either wants to do something less or maybe start doing something else more, we start by thinking about, well, what exactly is it that we're talking about? And if we want to have something we want to change, we talk about behavior as being something that a person says or does. It's something that you can see. Now, that doesn't mean that behavior is something that only other people can see. I certainly see my thoughts. I know what's going on inside of me, and that's behavior. But I think that the kind of the test that I use is can I add, and this is obviously in English, ing to it. So playing is behavior. I can't add ing to autism, autism ing. Autism is not a behavior. Walking is a behavior. Being willful, not a behavior. So these are some examples of things. These are not behavior. And the reason this is important is really, what, like the, let's take the label stubborn. Stubborn is a label that we use for behavior, but I know a lot of children and adults, some people would say me, who are stubborn, but we do different things. This stubborn looks different in different people. So that's why it's important to be really clear about what exactly the person who you're interested in helping says or does, and to try not to use labels. Here's some examples of some common problem behaviors in people with autism, disabilities, and neurotypical children as well. And so these are just some of the things that we might want to address. Some of them maybe are a little milder and some are more severe. The starting point for me is always asking, is this behavior interfering with a child's life? Because if it's not interfering with their ability to learn, their ability to be in society, in the community, then I might not intervene. If somebody's flapping their hands sometime, 
that might be okay. It's okay. We all have idiosyncrasies. So we want to start with focusing on, is this behavior really a problem? Um, so let's, let's talk about a quick example. So this is Satish, and let's say that Satish, when his parents want to go to the market, he goes to the market with them, but very quickly he starts to engage in some problem behavior. Now, what many parents would do, and I confess that with my own child when he was younger, he would have meltdowns in stores occasionally, and you know, it was really embarrassing, and he was really sad, and I left the store and tried to calm him down. And this is what happens with Satish. His parents leave the market, and he calms down. So I, I guess, what do you think, what has Satish learned? This happens multiple times. What do you think Satish is learning? Anybody want to give me an idea? I hear whisper, whisper, whisper. Yeah, he might be learning that this behavior is kind of working for him, right? Maybe there's something about going to the market that he's not liking. He now has a way to avoid it. So this is Atika. She, um, this might seem familiar to anybody who's a parent. Anybody a parent in here of a child with autism or a neurotypical child? Have any of you ever, nobody's a parent, for reals? Come on. <laughs> okay, I'm a parent. So um, my child, Something about the phone ringing, someone coming to the door, me trying to talk to a friend or partner, um, trying to cook something, it seemed to be a signal when he was little for him to go from playing happily and quietly by himself to suddenly wanting my attention. So this little girl, her parent is busy doing something else. She starts to scream. She often hits herself. It's terribly upsetting to see your child harming themselves. So of course, the parent stops what they're doing and goes to calm her. What is she learning? Well, she might be learning that she has a way of getting her parents' attention. Now, the one thing that's important is that the starting point for me, and again, this is a starting point. Remember, I said this is a simple explanation. It's not the only one, but it's a good starting point, is to think about problematic behavior as being a way of communicating. So if somebody is engaging in a behavior that is difficult or that you don't like, you might stop and ask yourself, what is this person trying to tell me? What is their behavior saying? What are they trying to get across? There are some children and adults, I'm using the word children, but this is applicable to people with autism across the lifespan. Some, there are some people who have really limited ways of communicating or none. Sometimes it's basic like, I'm not able to tell you that I'm hungry. Or it could be more complex, like I can say that I'm hungry and I want to eat, but I cannot tell you that what I would really like is some garlic naan. I don't want, oh, paneer, although who wouldn't want paneer? Um, but I, maybe I want garlic naan, but I don't have a way to tell you that. And there's other children who can ask for what they want, but they still engage in problem behavior. But I think it's still useful to use this frame of communication as a starting point. The same thing is true for parents, for adults. We all behave because it's paying off for us in some way. We all like positive outcomes with our children. As parents, all parents, parents of children with autism are no different than parents of neurotypical children. We want our children to be successful. We want them to be happy. We want them to be independent. We love to have positive interactions to play with our child. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I also really like to rest. I like to be able to sit down. I love it when my child sleeps through the night. I love it when we can go out to eat and there are no tantrums and people aren't staring at me like I'm some sort of horrible parent. Those are things that I like. I'm going on too much about myself, I'm sorry. Um, but we also have things that we don't like. We don't like it when our children are sad. We don't like having to manage problem behavior. And we really don't like it, at least I don't, when I can tell that people are thinking I'm a bad mother or there's something wrong with me because of the way my child is acting. Those things are horrible. So like we talked about with Satish, we know that he, maybe, maybe one reason he is doing this is because it works for him. He's communicating to his parents that he does not like something about being at the market. But his parents, oh, this is also working for his parents in the short term because they're avoiding some negative outcomes. The same thing with Adita. Her parents have learned how to help her stop hurting herself. They know that if they just go to her, even though it's interrupting them being able to get things done, it's paying off in that they're helping their child. So what we know about problem behavior, and again, 
simple at explanation, just a starting point, is that if a behavior is continuing to occur, it must be paying off in some ways. And these are some of the ways that a behavior might pay off. Sometimes somebody might engage in problem behavior to get attention, maybe to get something like access to an iPad um, or sensory input. Sometimes we think that only people with autism engage in behavior for sensory reasons, but I really love music. I don't love music because I get something when I listen to music. I love music because I like how it sounds. We also might engage in problem behavior or behavior in general to avoid things. It turns out that some people don't like to be the center of attention. I bet there's some of you in this room who would not like to be on this red dot right now. That's cool. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it either. Um, maybe people avoid doing certain things like going to the market or to avoid sensory input. I don't like the sound of loud alarms and I cover my ears because it blocks that. So Satish's parents aren't bad parents. The reason they left the store is that it makes life easier for them too, at least in the short term. But the problem is, when things like this happen in the long term, we can have a cascade of negative effects. Satish might start to have difficult behavior in more settings. He's also missing a critical skill, which is being able to tolerate being at the market in public places. And that's a really important adaptive behavior for him as he gets older and becomes independent. Similarly, his parents, if they're unable to go to the store, they're going to have a lot of difficulties too. I don't think a solution is to force him to go to the store. That won't be fun for anybody. An alternative is to make stores fun or at least tolerable for Satish. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, his parents could just not take him to the store. And I suppose for parents that have the resources to be able to do that, to have somebody else to watch him, that's a possibility. But again, Satish is missing out on learning something that's going to probably be very important for him down the road, and that's how to be in public places like markets. So what we, what we, what we want to do is you want to ask yourself a few questions. So in this example, we started out by asking Satish's parents, how quickly do problems happen? Because if as soon as he gets in the market, he starts to have some difficulties, I might start to wonder if there's something about the market. Maybe the noise is hurting his ears. Maybe it's too much for him. Maybe the press of people. So I want, I'm looking for signs also that there's something about sensory input that might be difficult for him. And if there is, I might try something like one of these things. These seem like easy solutions, but I'll tell you that this is almost never my starting point. And the reason for that is a couple of reasons. Some of these kinds of things, they're kind of stigmatizing. So if somebody has to be wrapped in a blanket when they're out in public, it can be kind of stigmatizing. Um, also, if you forget to bring the headphones, you might have real problems. So I will often use things like this, kind of like a Band-Aid, where we'll put it on and we'll use it while we work for a longer-term solution. In the case of this specific student, though, and I'm using a fake name, but a real case, he, his parents said that he was okay. He'd go in, he'd be in the market for about five, six minutes, and he'd do fine, and then things were not fine anymore. So what we did is that we helped his parents start with some really short trips. They picked a weekend when they had some time, and they decided, we decided that they would go to the market and they would stay for about three minutes. And we picked three minutes because five, that's when things started to go badly. So they go for about three minutes, and if he made it for about three minutes, he, his parents provided him a reward. And the reason we provided a reward is that going to the market was not very reinforcing. His parents wanted him to go, but there was nothing about being at the market that was working for Satish. So he, he was a little guy who, um, he loved Batman, he loved superheroes, he loved for his mother to play Batgirl, and he would be Batman, and they would go around and get bad guys. So his mother, she was awesome. She set up the situation where they'd go to the market. After a few minutes, they would leave. She'd go outside. She'd say, come on, let's go outside. Let's go play Batgirl. And they would chase each other around. And then a little while later, they'd go back in, and they'd do the same thing. And she gradually increased the amount of time that Satish was in the store before they would play Batgirl. And after about 10 minutes, when he was in for about 10 minutes, we set it up so he would earn little Bat Batgirl, Batman, superhero stickers, and after he had a certain number of stickers, they got to go play. And that's what she did. It took her about a month and a half to get to the point where he could tolerate being in the store for up to about 30, 35 minutes, and she said that was as long as she herself could tolerate. So we thought that was pretty good. And after not too long, he stopped needing the stickers anymore. So it's a simple solution, and sometimes simple solutions work. 
Another, another solution is to, to go back to this idea of communication. And I really like to teach children and adults ways to ask for what they want and what they need. Because I can ask for what I want, and it stands to reason I think everybody has the right to be able to ask for what they want. So, Adita would be a great example of somebody that I might try something like that with, and in fact we did. She had no appropriate way of telling her parents when she wanted them to come and play with her. So, the starting point for a communication-based intervention is to think about what exactly is it that your child is trying to tell you? And is there a better way for them to tell you that? Now, there's lots of ways to communicate. In her case, she said she wanted her parents' attention. We could have taught her to say, excuse me, I'd like you to play with me, please. She was not vocal, so that would probably take a while. We could have taught her to exchange a picture, but she didn't have very good fine motor skills, um, so we decided not to do that either. We could have taught her sign language, but the occupational therapist we work with said, yeah, no, she's not going to be able to get that for a while. So we knew we would get there, but we started with something really simple. We taught her to clap her hands. That's all we did. We taught her to clap her hands. I'm, I'm, my friends who are speech therapists in the back, I'm sure have better ideas, and you can talk to me later, but that's what I did. Um, it seemed like an easy solution. You want to teach whatever it is, saying play with me, signing play, using a card, whatever it is, you want to teach it in the context where that skill is going to be used. Another way to think about that is when your child is motivated to want, in Adita's case, to play. If I, if I had had her mother play with her for 10 minutes and then try to get her to clap her hands, she might not do it because she just had a lot of attention. So what we did instead is that we set up times where her mother or her father pretended to be busy doing other things, talking to each other, pretending to be on the phone, pretending to be cook, and after a couple of minutes, they would say, if you want me to play with you, just clap your hands. And she'd go, and they'd come running over and they'd play. And that's all we did. And pretty quickly, Adita started to clap her hands on her own, and we were all super happy. Now, as you can see, you want to make sure that you're prompting, you're trying to get your child to do the right behavior before the problem happens. And you also want to make sure it pays off more to do the good behavior instead of the bad one. So in Adita's case, when, her, when she clapped her hands, her mother or her father would come and they'd sit with her and they'd play and she loved enthusiastic attention. So, oh my gosh, I'm so happy you asked me to play. And you can, you can imagine what this looks like and I'm kind of making a fool of myself, so I'll stop now. Um, but when she engaged in self-injury, they felt like they couldn't ignore it. And in fact, I almost never tell parents to ignore something because I personally struggle to do it. And if I can't do it as a behavior analyst, who's like, you know, we're supposed to be cold and heartless, if I can't do it, Nobody, else. I'm certainly not going to ask a parent to do it. So instead, we talk to parents about respond to problem behavior like you're a brick wall. Do the same thing every time, be really consistent, and make it not very fun. So we had Adita's parents, when she started to hurt herself or scream, they would go to her and say, please stop, and then they'd go away. And if she did it again, they'd say, please stop. So you can see the contrast between getting the same thing every time, this brief, limited, neutral attention, and the, I'm so glad you wanted to play, what do you want to do? That's a big contrast. And she learned pretty quickly that what happened when she clapped her hands was a lot more valuable. Now, sometimes you might have a child who claps their hands all the time and you don't get anything done. So we talk about then, we use this like, really technical term called fading. All that means is you start to teach your child that Sometimes it might take a while, and there's lots of ways you can do that. So Adita's mother could have said, I'll be able to play with you in just a second, and waited maybe three seconds, and then gone over and played with her. Sometimes we do this really crazy thing where we'll have a parent wear a green necklace or a green shawl. <laughs> when I can play, sorry, I'm just fascinated by this, and maybe a red one when I'm not available, and when, the green, when I'm wearing my green shawl, if Adita, if Adita claps her hands, I go play with her, and if I have the red shawl on, I don't. And she'll learn pretty quickly when I am and am not available. So there's lots of ways to do that. Um, oh, this is not supposed to be here. So just close your eyes for a minute. Okay, now you can open them. This is where I wanted to be. Okay. Thank you for listening. I'm sure nobody saw the few slides in between. The, um, what I want to leave you with, I think, is, again, starting point, simple explanations. Sometimes 
sometimes it can be relatively simple. But I want you to know that there is hope. We are learning more every day about autism. We're learning more about helping people on the spectrum disorder, people who are really impacted, as well as folks who are doing really well, live a life that is the most meaningful life that they want to live. For, for individuals who have problem behavior, there is hope. There are things that we can do. And we also know that we can help people with autism without needing lots of drugs in, the most in most cases, without repeated hospitalizations. We don't need to use punishment. And even though I gave an example of stickers, we don't need to do things like that or not in the long term. Sometimes those things are like a bridge, stickers and things. But we don't need to do that for most people. The solution, the starting point, is really taking time to be a detective, to try to understand why your child, what is your child trying to tell you? And once you know what your child is trying to tell you, then you can problem solve other ways for your child to get what it is that they're trying to tell you across and to teach that. So again, a starting point, not the solution for everything, just a starting point. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me to your beautiful country.